Welcome back to Podcast Recovery, everybody. We are your hosts, David O. And Eric V. Today we are joined by our very uh, esteemed guest, Mr. Uh, Scott, a.k.a. Hoppy. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing good, brother. Where are you from, Hoppy? Uh, I'm originally from here, Catonsville, Maryland. Catonsville, Maryland. Cool. All right. Cool. And uh, when were you first introduced to recovery? Uh, probably during my second probation. <laughs> What year was that? Let's see. That would be 1990. 1990. Yeah, 1990. Fantastic. And how long have you been clean and sober? Clean and sober since April 27th, 1994. 1994. Wow. So it's it's been a couple of days. By far our longest predecessor we've had on the on the show so far. Uh, uh, I suspect that many of them are trying to do it the same way I am. If I can just stay out on my own way for today, I hear you. I, I'll probably be okay. Well, without further ado, I'm going to we're going to turn it over to you to share your uh, story with us. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I told you before this. This is I'm really nervous about this because I realize that this will be a share that people will be able to listen to if they are so interested. Yeah. Years from now. And I hope I make sense. Um, anyway, so my name is Scott. Uh, if I run into you at different meetings, I'll introduce myself as an alcoholic. I'll introduce myself as an addict. Uh, I've mentioned before at meetings that, you know, it's not just alcohol and drugs. Uh, I've discovered in recovery that I'm addicted to more. Uh -huh. It's sex, money, women, speed. Prestige, recognition, uh, accolades of my peers, mm. accolades of people who don't know me. Bottom line, if I like it, I want more, and I want more now. Mm -hmm. And I really don't care what it takes to get it or who gets in my way. Yeah. The uh, I've shared at a few meetings over the years that uh, I don't recall prior to recovery ever looking at other people and feeling like I'm part of them or I belong. Mm -hmm. uh, as far back as I can remember, I mean, I'm talking elementary school, kindergarten, five years old. That was like, what, 1840? Uh, I think it was a little earlier, but <laughs> I remember we used to go out and ride the dinosaurs Yeah, at, uh, at recess, right. yeah. And you'd ride on the slate with a chisel. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the thing was is that Everybody else, everybody seemed to have an idea of what to do and who to say and how to play the games and who to hang out with. And, mm -hmm. you know, when it came time to like, move into teams during recess, I'm used to being one of the last guys called on. Oh. Um, I, I'm, I kind of, I'm used to being in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, I'm used to having my name pronounced wrong and hearing my middle name said a lot because that's what happens when you're one of those kids. Yep. So, uh, and I say that because it's, it wasn't until recovery. Now, mind you, I didn't get clean and sober until I'm 30. Mm -hmm. So I spent a long time in this state of confusion. Uh, that problem got a little more exacerbated for me as I got a little older. Uh, my dad passed when I was seven years old, just before my eighth birthday. And uh, at that time, I don't think single parent families, you know, single mom families at the very first part of the 70s mm -hmm. were very popular or common. I mean, no. we, did, we didn't have TV shows for that quite yet. I mean, no. uh, but I, it was coming around. Mm -hmm. And so I lived in a neighborhood where everybody else had brothers, sisters, mom and dad. Mm -hmm. I had a brother and a mom, and everybody in the neighborhood knew my dad checked out. Yeah. So that feeling of being different was a little bit more at that point. Oh, yeah. Uh, a few years later, uh, we moved out to Carroll County, and I'm now I'm the new kid in the neighborhood, but it's a lot of transplants at this time, yeah. middle 70s, late 70s. And trying to figure out how I fit in out there, which I'm really not good at. <laughs> and I'm, I'm out there for literally a year when we run into an issue with my physical health. Uh, I, I got injured during football, which was a blessing later on because mm -hmm. that's how we discovered that I had cancer. And it was after this event that uh, I lost my leg, 
Yeah. And I went through a whole bunch of health issues. And I usually tell people at the meeting, if you're interested for more specifics, catch me afterwards and I'll be glad to fill you in. But now I don't even look like you people. Yeah. Um, I was already kind of tall. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of awkward. I'm not very athletically gifted. You're a little um, gangly. I'm a little gangly, you know. <laughs> I put on a few pounds since then, but I'm yeah. still on the thin side. And I just was, I was just physically a mess. Mm -hmm. And now it's totally and absolutely concrete. I don't feel like you people and I don't look like you people. And, uh, did kids make that apparent like at the time? Well, cause kids I, are fucking jerks. Well, I mean, I started wearing glasses in third grade because yep, I can't see the board. Yep. So, of course, you know, and I don't even think about this until <clears throat> somebody asks me. I can remember being picked on and being called four eyes. And mm -hmm. uh, because of my last name, I mean, I got picked on because they call you star burst and star butt and star head. And yeah. I've got and four eyes. And now I'm the one legged star butt, four eyed freaking. Uh, <sighs> And I, and I had no smooth with girls to begin with. But when you're 13 and on crutches and, yeah. by the way, chemotherapy knocks out all of your hair. Yeah. So puberty's here, but puberty can't even get into gear because chemotherapy says, no, you don't grow hair. Yeah. And you don't grow hair on the top of your head. It falls out in clumps. Mm. And then your eyebrows disappear. Oof. And your eyelashes disappear. Really? And you wow. are, I mean, you are literally a freaking bald person from head to toe. Wow. And uh, so I did. I mean, I, I looked freakish for a while there. Yeah. Uh, the There was some complications to this event that uh, kind of changed. I don't want to say they're pivotal, but... They're important to my story mm -hmm. because through the chemo, and I was supposed to do that for two years, and when I look back at what was going to be done to my body that we didn't do, and I hear people talking about chemo that they go through today, and I don't want to make light of it. It's a horrible process. Mm -hmm. I would not wish it on people I hate. Yeah. But it's very, it's really a lot less now than it used to be because they just didn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I they they I should glow in the dark for yeah. what they did to me, but uh, part of the process is is they they run you through a bunch of tests and they're like okay we need you to come back into the hospital because there's uh, an unclear spot on your chest X ray. Uh, in 1978, an unclear spot on your chest X ray is a mastation of cancer that's in your chest. It's in your rib cage. And mm. there is no amputation for your rib cage. No. It is expiration time. Uh, and up until this point, I, 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 like many of our speakers that I've listened to, I'm a little ADD. So my story gets scrambled in my brain because mm -hmm. I can't remember it all in order that I want to be clear. Um, I had drank prior to this. I drank when I was very little. My family still tells the story of one of my mom's earliest parties where he's a cute little baby. Look how well behaved he is. <laughs> cute little baby, three years old, walked around and snuck drinks off of everybody's drink at the party. I'm lit. The tree and I are both flashing and twinkling. <laughs> I am lit. Um, My favorite question is, what's your first drink? But if you're drinking at three, you have no fucking I, idea. I really, whatever was there. We'll call uh, it Schlitz and call it, it a day. It pro yeah, I mean, whatever. <laughs> Natty Bo, who knows? It was probably all of those things. But, you know, I just was walking around picking up people's drinks and taking a slug off of it because... Oh, the 70s. Every, everybody else was doing that. That was still the 60s. That was, what, 69? That was, that was, yeah, that would be 60s, like seven or eight. Um, and, uh, you Different know, I, time. I, should, I should be clear. Um, I, I don't think it was because people were being negligent. Mm -hmm. I think they were being communal. I think they were having a good yeah. time. They're enjoying their party. And when little dude like me walks up and picks up a rum and Coke and takes a swig off of it, oh, look at how cute that is. Yeah. Know, it was 67, 68. Yeah. Um, my folks did as good a job as they could with what they were given. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will tell you that I also, you know, like I said, through all those other things, I watched my folks, my family, they're party people. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, family gatherings 
include food and music and drinking. Yeah. Um, it's oh, typical yeah. blue collar, you know, cold beer in the keg. And yep. I, I remember being little thinking about, man, when it's my turn, when <laughs> I get to be a grown up and I get to party with the family like the family does. And I was really looking forward to that. So let me go back to now this, the, the, the cause and effect of the cancer and the chemo and so now I'm 13, getting ready to be 14. There's, there's complications and issues, and uh -huh. something changed. I, uh, this, this recurring issue with having to go back to the hospital and follow up, you know, how yeah. much damage has been done. One of the CAT scans indicates that there's brain damage. How much? Well, we don't really know. That's really not that That's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's not, but when you're when you're... When I was younger, it kind of flipped me out. Oh, I'm I mean, sure. I, it's I can put terrifying. Up, I, I can process it now, and I'm okay, because mm -hmm. it is what it is. Uh, I don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer, I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that. But back then, it was horrifying to think about what the future was going to be, mm -hmm. um, and knowing that I'm already awkward, and I'm already, you know, an outsider on the planet. So something... <sighs> I had been pretty diligent about being on the folks, you know, that I that I cared about. You know, you guys got to quit smoking cigarettes. They're killing you. They're terrible. I mean, yeah. we see these movies in school and you know what? I'm not sure how long I'm going to get to stay. Uh -huh. Tell you what, you guys just do whatever the hell you want to do because I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to do. A buddy of mine catches me where, like I said, 14, 15, 14. Hey, Scott. Let's go buy some beer. Now, mind you, in Carroll County in 1978, buying beer is a 15-minute bicycle ride. Yeah. Which is a pretty cool trick for a one-legged guy. Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to go play Hey Mister at the closest liquor store, which is three, four miles away. It's going to take a few minutes on bikes and hills to get there. And, mm -hmm. you know, we do what we do. You know, a couple of dollars, get you six beers. Yeah. Go around the back of the building, go off the parking lot into the woods, start drinking beer. And Scott has this moment where he realizes if he drinks faster than you do, mm -hmm. I get four. You get two. Sucks to be you. <laughs> and let me tell you, the second you figure that out, if you're if you party like I party, there you go. That's what you do. You just got to do everything faster, harder, and more. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did. And I don't remember whether or not that particular event was... You know, it, it wasn't like we were drinking Jack Daniels and they got that deep, warm sensation. I just remember thinking, like, it kind of made stuff slow down. Um, and the story that goes on in my head kind of came into focus a little bit. And it wasn't quite so scary. And I felt like maybe we could do a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't wait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was 14. I, I, it wasn't very long after that that somebody said, hey, man, you know, we've got a couple of beers. And then you hear, want this? And you're like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, pass that thing off. And, mm -hmm. Scott, pass that. Scott, pass that. <laughs> oh, no, dude, I'm good. <laughs> no, Scott, you got to pay. Hey, if I get, you know, I pull on it three and four times and you're only pulling once, it's more for me and less for you. And it sucks to be you. <laughs> and that's the way my freaking, my addict brain believes and thinks. Mm -hmm. uh, it, un, undeterrable once it's started into motion. Yeah. Um, I, I did not have a lot of problems uh at that point in time, mm -hmm. I, I did get in some trouble because this is high school. Yeah, you know, there's there's some uh, disciplinary actions related to alcohol at school, and of course, you know, I got uh, I got kicked out of school for being drunk at one of the functions. I got kicked nice. off the bus for being drunk and high on there. I did I did all the crap that I've heard other people talk about. Mm -hmm. I went to school drunk. I went to school high. Yep. I was the recreational pharmaceutical distribution representative. <laughs> that is an elaborate fucking title. Yeah, well, you know, it doesn't have any cool when you just say you're a dealer. 
<laughs> yeah, I, that's true. I, I just you, you added know, some style to that. I, I appreciate I, that. I considered it to be rendering a service. There were people that wanted yes. to do what I wanted to do, and I should be able to help that along and get to partake. Fucking um, a. That's a, exactly a, how I felt. So, uh, and it's funny because you know. I never, ever at that point considered the fact that uh, I might be coming an alcoholic or a drug addict. At the point in time, it was, I was a partier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was a partier. Yep. And partiers partied. And that meant if it was booze, you mm -hmm. said yes. If somebody busted out weed, you said yes. Mm -hmm. If the pills came out, you said two, please. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it didn't matter what they were. Um and back in the beginning, uh, excuse me, at the beginning, it really didn't matter. Mm. Uh, I, I did, I did discover that there were some substances that I did not enjoy as much as others. Uh, I did cocaine, you know, it mm. was, it was pretty prevalent at that point. Yeah. It's the seventies. I'm a pretty wound up guy to begin with. Yeah. Uh, I don't need accelerants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly where I was constantly searching for the things that would take the edge off mm -hmm. that would slow things down that would allow them to come into focus mm. uh, i've shared you know with a lot of the guys that i've talked to over the years that there are moments inside of my brain that it's like being locked in the uh, the audio visual room at like best buy or something <laughs> and every television's on a different channel and they're all turned up to 10 and it's deafening and it's confusing but, but these go to 11 uh, yeah and I'm, <laughs> I'm just like i'm just trying to figure out any combination of alcohol and drugs and whatever to get like like just get them all on the one channel mm -hmm. and then try to get the volume down to something that doesn't require screaming to be heard yep. and then maybe we can work on the color and the contrast and it doesn't even matter that the story is horrible still <laughs> at least it's kind of uniform and consistent and ultimately i just need to get quiet enough that i can go back to sleep mm -hmm. um and hopefully not be haunted by what goes on in my head while I'm sleeping. Because yep. I, I was never a very good sleeper. I, again, mm -hmm. back to childhood elementary days, not a good sound sleeper. So uh, that was always my quest from, from high school on is to now figure out what this magic combination of things are that yeah. bring, uh, again, a focus and slow down and get stuff quiet enough that it's not just terrorizing me from the inside out. Mm. Uh, the benefits are is I'm taller now when I drink. Mm. I'm actually suave. I'm good looking. I know how to interact with women. Although I have no success, I'm confident in my failures. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think I can dance, which is really hysterical. Oh, God, it, that's got to be hilarious. It, it's, it's basically, you know, you can imagine it. It's, it's like a one-legged guy who's trying not to fall rhythmically. <laughs> that's about what it really is. Uh, and I, I've got to be honest with you. I had a great time. Yeah. Uh, I had a great time mixing things together. You know, it's like as cool as it was to be smoking pot and drinking beer and having shots of Jack Daniels, you know, and then somebody goes, Hey, you tried acid and you quickly realize that you've got to say yes to acid either really early in the night or wait till the next day because you're not going to go to bed for 24 hours. No. And, you know, you might not want to say three instead of just one because if that's the case, you know, the floor can open up and swallow you. And oh, yeah. It's, um, and then you're like, oh, and there's quaaludes too. Oh, okay. So now not only can I not sleep, I can't feel anything. I mean, Fuck. <laughs> Good Lord. It's just, but that's what you did. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. if yeah, one, that's what I did. It, 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 not that, the ludes. Minus did, the ludes. Yeah. It, you didn't, we didn't know. I didn't understand, you know, that whole one's too much and no. there is no such thing as not enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything you could add to this cocktail was good. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I remember just trying to, like, you know, if you could get your fingers to kind of get numb, 
and you get that kind of low humming buzzing sound in your ears yeah that's just perfect man my car would fly when i was like that (laughs) (laughs) just uh, you know it was awesome and it was like a 66 impala when it was nothing i didn't have anything done to that but you know i just you would feel so good Mm -hmm. um and i couldn't wait uh, to, to get like that every single chance I could. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, as I go through high school and I, I, I get done that a year early and I go into college because now I can hang out in this environment where I'm actually one of the youngest people in that educational environment. Instead mm-hmm. of being like a junior in high school who's at the end of the run, now I'm a new guy in, yeah. in college. Mm-hmm. and Because uh, I, I already know that me, is, I'm not going to make my money swinging a hammer Okay. I'm yeah. Not, I'm not going to be a carpenter. Or I'm not going to be a plumber. I'm not going to pull wire. Yeah. I I gotta I gotta figure out how to get paid, <laughs> stay out of jail, and do something with my mind, not so much my body. Mm-hmm. And I'm also starting to come to terms with because at this point I'm 16, going on 17, and wow, I, these last two years are getting kind of blurry. Maybe. Maybe, and I stopped going to those follow-up visits for the doctors down at Hopkins because, you know, if they x-ray my chest one more time and tell me shit's bad, it's probably uh, something to do with all the other things I've been doing and not so much the cancer or the chemo now. Yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and keep going at this as hard as I can because mm-hmm. I'm not going to be a pretty young corpse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Probably going to be a young corpse, but not going to be pretty. I'm going to just burn it up. Oof. And and at this point, I mean, it's full throttle, just whatever. Um, I'm going to school. Trouble's becoming a little bit more prevalent for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think I dropped out of college three times. Um, and it was always the same thing because I performed poorly mm-hmm. because I was too messed up. What college? Uh, I went to Catonsville Community College. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I did finally get out of there with an AA degree. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I went, took about a year off to do some more partying and more research before I yeah, it, fucking I. I enrolled at the uh, University of Baltimore to pursue uh, the second half, to, to you know, the next two years to get a bachelor's degree. Mm-hmm. The other thing I found out going down to University of Baltimore, while it's pretty well known for the Robert Merrick School of Business, mm-hmm. they also have a pretty significant law school. Mm-hmm. And you have no idea law school kids party <laughs> wow man there was beer and that freak oh my god yeah, that's and, true and you know it's 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 i'm one of these people again it's okay so we're gonna drink beer in here that just means i'm gonna smoke pot outside of the building before i come in mm-hmm. and that way i've got cotton mouth i'll drink beer in here until i've you know either got to go pee or puke or whatever i got to do and then i'll go back yeah. outside and get high and smoke some more cigarettes and come back in and drink more beer because i'm empty again yeah <sighs> I got to tell you, one of the things I really like about recovery at this point in my life is the insane, insane things alcoholics and addicts say. Mm -hmm. And I know that when we say them, they seem like totally reasonable, most brilliant thing I've ever done. Fucking genius ideas. But but in recovery, I look back and go, man, how stupid. Stupid was that? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember being at a party and getting horribly sick, mm-hmm. and I mean throwing up until I was crying. <laughs> and as soon as I could get my stuff back oh, together, yeah. I'm like, oh, my stomach's empty. I guess I can go back to drinking now. Yeah. That, yep. That's that's just ridiculous. Oh, God, and let me get a let me get a breath mint and a beer. <laughs> And like when I was growing up, that was like a badge of honor. It was a fucking puke and rally. Like uh, that's what it was. It's it, it is. It's one of those things. It's like if if you've ever gotten used to waking up with fluids on your clothes that oh. may or may not be yours, Oof. and you're okay with that, we got a chair for you. Yeah, we got <laughs> we got some meetings for you, buddy. Yeah, because 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 regular normal people, normies, no, yeah. they don't have any idea what that is. You no. know. And we kind of get used to that behavior. It's like, mm, 
it smells like pee. I, I hope it's mine. You know what I mean? I really, I'm hoping I just, you know, lost my balance and peed down my pants leg. And I'm hoping somebody else didn't pee on me and I can't remember being peed on. Yeah. But it's entirely possible. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the disease is really having its way with me at this point. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the trouble through school, um, I've, 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 I've moved up and gotten some decent uh, some jobs, and I'm trying to get through this. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I'm trying to uh, remain employable and pay my rent and get grades. The mm-hmm. I, I find myself, you know, the weekends start on Thursday, sometimes Thursday morning or yeah. Wednesday, and they don't end on Sunday. They end Monday, usually late in the afternoon when the hangovers finally wore off. Tuesdays are really rough. <clears throat> Tuesdays can be rough. Um, <laughs> I, re- I can recall uh, working downtown. Uh, I had a semi-private office. They Part of the compensation package, they, uh, they gave me a garage parking in the building. And uh, I, I'm, again, crazy, crazy stuff. I... I I, I had tried going into the office high, uh, and this is like 19, this is 1989, 88, 89, and computers were in the office. I know it seems ridiculous, but they were oh, literally yeah. monochromatic computers yep. where with like two floppy drives. Oh, and when you're hungover or high or both, because being high when you're hungover hopefully takes the hangover down a notch. Yeah. Um, yep. And you're trying to look at a spreadsheet, and the numbers are going like this. <laughs> and then you can't see this on the radio, but I'm shaking my hand like uh, like Parkinson's or something. And it's just, you're like, oh, my God, I am going to throw up just looking at this monitor. Oh, God. Okay. Ugh. It's bad enough being hungover. Scott, you can't get high when you're hungover at work. Yeah. But now it's 5 o'clock. And I have to drive four layers or four levels up out of the parking garage. And why would I think that it's okay for me to be smoking pot from the fourth level down? Anybody behind my car is going to smell that. Oh, yeah. But I didn't. You You can't give a shit. You don't give a shit, shit, man. Fuck that guy. It's after work. You know what I mean? And then I found guys at work that wanted to get high. Like, let's go play Frisbee over on Federal Hill and go smoke pot after work. Oh, just, it's insane. Yeah. You know? And, I, and I, I think back about these moments that just like, I have no idea how I really expected to be able to keep that job. Yeah. After a while, you know, you can put a shirt and a tie on me and that don't make me any better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was just crazy at that point. The, uh, I picked up my first DWI and I'm on probation through at this point. Mm -hmm. My employer has been made aware that there's a problem, but I haven't been, I haven't been told that I have to go do any meetings yet. And I've got a DDMP and I, what the fuck is that? uh, At the time, the DDMP was a drunk driving, I'm sorry, DDPM, the drunk driving probation monitor. Oh. Or the DDMP drunk driving monitoring program and okay, I'd, you had a probation some officer. sort of acronym, yeah, yeah, and it was specific to alcohol. You know, okay. it wasn't criminal activity. It's it's not that there isn't criminal activity in my history. I, I you just, just got away with it at that time. I, I I think, believe it or not, I think a lot of people would see me coming and realize that stuff just wasn't okay. Mm-hmm. And they would cut you some slack. Uh. Um, I, I, I have, I have, to my advantage, been misperceived as being a war veteran, <sighs> and I use that to every to oh, every God. bit I could from that. Um, people have thought I'm much older than I am, and I've used that to my advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm a, a conniving scoundrel. You know, and it's not something to be proud of. It was just that when I realized that I could use what would otherwise be perceived as something not so positive to mm-hmm. my advantage, and I get more, <laughs> I get more. Yeah. I love it. So I I, I guess I was uh, a fairly smooth talker, mm-hmm. even, even trashed. Uh, 
I have spoken to the police on more than one occasion where I've heard, you know, we don't want to come back here tonight. And the knock at the doors happened again. And I remember going, Officer Davis, I thought you said you didn't want to come back here again. Can I get you a beer this time? Yeah. <sighs> I'm... I'm I'm that guy. I mean, I mean, Jesus. At, at the party when they say whatever you do, don't let Scott answer the door. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, we're don't, locking you in the fucking basement, yeah, dude. Don't let freaking Starry near the door. God knows what'll come out of his mouth when somebody shows up, and and it's it's just like that. Mm -hmm. The um. So so anyway, the, the, this this point where I've gotten this first DWI, and it's not necessarily an impossible idea that I might have a problem. You know, mm -hmm. I'm getting up on like 23, 4, mm -hmm. 5. Uh, everybody I know that's my age, you know, finished high school a year after me, but finished college three years ahead of me. Because <gasps> uh, they've nice. also, they're not hanging out at happy hours and smoking weed in the parking lot and looking for LSD on the weekends and shit yeah. like that, okay? Because their wives and husbands expect them to be home and they've got kids to take care of and yeah. mortgages. And I'm still literally paying rent, driving, you know, whatever car it was. And yeah. I, I had, at this point, I had a, a young lady hostage as a partner. Um, uh, Unfortunately, you know, she she was really raked through a lot of mucky, cruddy crap because the disease was having its way with me, and I was uh, I was a rag doll along for the ride. I just didn't have any idea. But mm -hmm. I mean, I have this notion that stuff's not supposed to be like this. I just don't know what I should be doing yeah. elsewise. Uh, I heard somebody talking like on one of the earlier ones. You know, it's no real skills at processing life as it was happening, uh, yeah. dealing with my emotions. Um, I drink and drug when I'm happy. Mm -hmm. I drink and drug when I'm not. Yep. And I drink and drug excessively every chance I can. I, I drink and use drugs to the point where I gray out, brown out, black out, pass out. Brown out's I, probably the worst. I, I can't tell you how many nights, worse yet, hours of my life yeah. I have no recollection of. Yep. Um, I had a terrible sense of fear when looking at the fourth step about mm -hmm. the stuff that I need to make amends for because I don't remember what I did. Mm -hmm. um, in my teens, early 20s, when the phone would ring, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and it'd be one of your buddies. And mind you, this is the phone that hangs on the wall with the wire. It's not a yeah, cell phone. Is, yeah. Right. And everybody in your family can hear these conversations. I mean, you can stretch the cord and go down the steps in the basement and maybe your mom doesn't hear every word. But, dude, do you remember what you did? And the stories were awesome because, you know, I did this ridiculously wild, crazy crap all the time. You know, my decision-making skills suck. When I'm yeah. clean and sober, yep. you add alcohol and drugs and they are legendary tales of what it was that I didn't die from this time. Yep. The, uh, <laughs> and when you're, you know, when you're 16, oh, 17, 18 years old, those are great because I'm, I get to relive all the, the, the highlights of the night. Oh before. yeah. You're full on Superman complex at that point. <clears throat> when you're 25. It's a little bit different. And the phone rings. And you know the conversation's going to start with, dude, do you remember what you did last night? That's a different tone. And you don't want to hear that story. Uh. And then the phone rings, and you know that's what the phone call's going to be. And the phone makes, the ringing of the phone makes you cower. Oh. Because I don't want to hear that shit. Mm. I, I know what it's going to be. I mean, I don't know the specifics, but I know, I know it's, I know it's about what I did last night. Mm -hmm. I know I don't remember. It's probably going to be bad. Let me see if my car's even parked out back tonight. Mm -hmm. you know, did I, did I park my car here or did I? And that's, that's probably about the point where it's like, well, you know, I didn't think I was going to be here these last ten years. And this this idea of having as much fun as I want to have all the time, any time, without anybody telling me, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. I got to find a way to reel this back. 
because this is starting to suck, you know. This, this, this woman I've taken hostage is almost always pissed off with me for something stupid I said did, and I don't always remember what it was. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm getting a lot of looks from people at work. Um, there's comments about how bad I smell, which it shouldn't be surprising. I haven't been home in three days. I mean, I was smart enough to leave a shirt in my vehicle to change shirts, you know, like a blue mm. shirt on Monday, a white shirt on Tuesday, and then put Monday's blue shirt back on Wednesday. <laughs> yep. You know, but they haven't been laundered. No. Neither have I, you know. And no. my, my breath has just got to be horrendous because, I mean— you don't brush your teeth if you haven't been home. I mean, who keeps a toothbrush in their vehicle? I wasn't that smart. No. I, I had I had parties to go to. I knew at least a half a dozen after-hours clubs in Baltimore. All I got to do is just bang on the door, that little slide. And, hey, come on in, dude. It's good mm -hmm. to see you again. You know, because I'm, I'm literally... <laughs> 2.30 in the morning, I'm leaving a bar going to the, you know, basement place. He's going to fucking speakeasies in the mid-80s. <laughs> they were everywhere. <laughs> they were everywhere. I'm sure. Uh, and, and dude, the, the the caliber of these people, you know. Oh. In re in the, re they were the dregs. You know what, man? In recovery, again, one of these things we learn about is the, the our lower companionship. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I remember early on in my recovery thinking poorly of these people as being my lower or lesser than companionship. Mm -hmm. it, I probably I probably was clean and sober mm, 10 or more years before it finally hit me. I'm somebody else's lower or lesser companionship. Ooh. You know, I. Well, thanks for fucking out my mind. Well, God damn it! It's just you know, I, it, when I when I got to recovery, I was a train wreck, dude. I yep. mean, I was a, a horribly inflated ego and low self esteem, and I with no idea what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my uh, second DWI in 1990, I guess it was, and I li I mean, I was dazed days from having my first probation ended uh. and i'm at work and the phone rings and it's uh it's bob who i believe is passed but i believe passed sober bob bob gets on the phone he goes scott you got arrested last night i said yeah because you're on probation dumbass you need to come in right now bob i got a lot going on today at work i said can i come in and see you tomorrow and he goes <laughs> He says, what part of you don't understand of you're on probation and you got arrested? He goes, if you don't come to my office now, I'm sending sheriffs into your office and they're going to arrest you and handcuff you and you're going to jail. You're going to jail. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I got to talk to you. He says, Scott, you really, all you need to do is tell your boss that you're leaving. And if they fire you, that's, that's a whole nother issue. You absolutely have to roll up here to Westminster and come see me now. Yeah. Uh, that was that was the next event that got me into an outpatient program, mm -hmm. and the first time I got introduced to uh, the steps and going to meetings, and mm -hmm. uh, I remember even before sitting in front of the judge and talking to a lawyer, they're like, you know, it's really going to be beneficial for you if you can uh, establish a pattern of trying to stay clean and sober, mm -hmm. you know, attend meetings and get this little stamp and get this signed, yeah. and I had a little blue piece of paper and. Well, that, that was a lot. That was a lot to process. Yeah. When I, I, you know, I'm 26, I'm not done. I'm not done. No. You know, I, I'll grant you, I've got to figure out a way to kind of rein this back in and get this into a little bit more manageable process. Because I, I would like to stop talking to the police officers because mm -hmm. they generally don't care for me. Uh, no. I think I think they're all a bunch of obnoxious tools, but it's, you know. It's their job to be that way. I just don't want to see them, you know. Yeah. And, you know, if I could get my girlfriend to stop hating me, you know, that would be nice. And if I could get my employer to, to not be on me because I am frequently tardy, frequently drunk, frequently hungover, and clearly not at a higher standard of productivity, you know, <laughs> that would all be good. Yeah. Um, and, again, arrogant and egotistical. So I went ahead and put together about a year 
went through the process of collecting the coins. I graduated from their uh, outpatient program at six months and continued to go to meetings. And I heard all the little slogans in 90 and 90 and blah, 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 blah. And so I went to a ton of meetings. And I also figured out that it's about three bucks over at the office depot or Staples. And you can get a couple of these little stamps made. And oh. I can, I got three different pens so I can sign it in black ink or blue ink or red ink. And if you write with your left hand, it doesn't look like anything. And <laughs> collected coins all the way up through a year didn't bother to get a sponsor didn't bother to get a home group didn't bother to read a book didn't mm -hmm. bother to talk about a freaking higher power just mm -hmm. white knuckling all this stuff through and hey man it's see it's not a big deal i got a i got a one-year coin I'm, yeah i am king shit on turd mountain <laughs> And I watched Rusty Wallace's car go tumbling through the infield on a, cause I'm a racing guy. Yeah, he's an NASCAR and that, guy. that sent me over the edge and a year of not drinking. And I immediately had to have a Miller genuine draft because Rusty Wallace went end over end <laughs> in the infield. And next thing you know, I'm going back for a second six pack and I'm, I drank 24 beers before Saturday or Sunday was over. Mm. And then a buddy of mine calls the next day and I'm feeling rough. And he's like, well, you know, I got, yeah, bring that on by. Let's do gravities and I'll get some beer and <laughs> <laughs> we'll put on Ren and Stimpy. And <laughs> it doesn't matter, but let's just do that. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, and I, and I do mean this as unfortunately is, is because, again, it's the, uh, the disease is having its way with me. And I'm trying everything I can at this point to manage this. Uh, I've gone through the process of, well, I'll only drink beer and I won't drink whiskey and I won't do any drugs. To, I'll only drink whiskey, I won't drink beer and I won't do any drugs. Or I'll only do drugs, but I'm only going to smoke weed. Or this time I'm only going to take these Valiums. Um, or I'm going to drink whiskey, but in between every whiskey, I'm going to have a glass of water because it'll fill my stomach up more like when I was drinking beer. <laughs> or I'm going to drink whiskey and I'm going to smoke some weed, but I'm not going to take any Valiums and I'm not going to take any LSD if anybody's got... Oh my God. Oh, you know what? I'm going to drink just the way I want I'm to. I'm exhausted but listening you, to that. But you got to promise that you're going to let me spend the night here. Put me on the sofa, on the floor. I'll help clean up the kitchen. I'll do whatever you need to do tomorrow morning. I'll scrub toilets if that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. But you can't let me drive because when I drive, I get, I get in trouble because mm -hmm. the car does 122 miles an hour. Ooh. And and if it does that, I, I have to drive it that fast because the disease of more says if it's 65 is good, 85 is better. And, you know, push it all the way to the carpet and it's 122 or three or four and it doesn't go any faster, but it doesn't stop. Uh, so you well, should, it does, but you're not going to like it. You should do that. And <laughs> it's, it's just, again, it, there's this crazy notion. I don't understand well, I do now, but I didn't then, you know. Why do we do that? Well, I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Mm -hmm. and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's, that is our nature. It is our natural state to do wildly inappropriate things at all of the wrong times mm -hmm. with no, with no acknowledgement of the danger or oh, consequences. Yeah. That's, that's what we do. And think it's totally fucking normal. Awesome. Yeah. It's not even Even, even Yeah, it's, it's even better awesome. than normal. It's fucking awesome. It's awesome, dude. It's yeah. awesome to be Jesus. driving this car into the red line and hearing the tires squeal as you try to corner. Ooh. It's awesome. It's awesome that the fact that I, I have think to Eric's hold... a speeder. It's, no. it's awesome that you have to hold the steering wheel with one hand and cover your eye with the other. Oh, God. That's dangerous. You know? It's awesome that at least it. it's January and it's cold, so you can open up the window and the cold air will help keep you awake. I think that's a myth. That never worked. <clears throat> what? Um, it's a the cold. Open up the fucking yeah. window when you're drunk. And yeah, get yeah a cold that's blast. Not, you just got a cold I mean, drunk. When you're like no, you just got a cold drunk. Yeah, when you're like nodding out, that totally helps. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe. So the uh, th this 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 is you know this is where it's gotten bad, and mm -hmm. I've. I've uh, I've been kicked out of my apartment. I've been let go from my job. Uh, the that woman that I had hostage finally figured out how to escape, and that was devastating. So of course, what did I do when that hurts? You fucking drank a drug. That's what we do. Yep. Um, when I got told that I was no longer welcome to show up this established to earn a paycheck, I went out and got high and got drunk. 
Uh, when I got kicked out of that one place, I went to another place where the people who lived there partied like I partied. Mm. So yep. as long as I can add to the party fund, we're good. Yep. Um, and I'm stuck because yep. I'm still me. And I remember what those meetings were like. And uh, I hated those people. Those mm. arrogant sons of bitches telling me that you could freaking not drink or not use drugs and be happy and joyous and free and blah, 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 and just for today and blah. Oh, my God. There's got to be a secret to that. There's, mm. there's, a, there's a secret that I haven't figured out. And they're yeah. not smarter than I am. I'm going to have to try and look at this again and see if I can, whatever that secret is, so that I can get out of trouble, get things under control, and do go back to doing what I want to do the way I want to do. Mm. Um, and I spent about a three year, 91, two, three in and out and back and forth and more trouble and, you know, just complete humiliation over being who I was and being stuck who I was. Uh, I, my, my family pretty much decided, you know, I knew that there was a Christmas party coming up. But I didn't told I wasn't told what the weekend was because mm. that way they don't gotta watch me overdo it and be sleeping on the sofa, making an embarrassing fool of myself by, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Um and you know what? That that's okay too. That's that's just part of the price of all of this, you know. It's better that oh, I wanna be up there anyway. I don't have to wanna wear a clean shirt and blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. The uh Living over near Security Mall in a in a shitty apartment where you kind of get used to hearing gunshots every couple of weeks. And back then it was just every couple of weeks. And then you find out who got killed, you know, and it was the building over there. And ah, man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. Mm-hmm. You know, I hear Alice Cooper screaming in my head, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. And I had no idea what I was gonna do. Yep. There was um there was AA and I'm sorry, there was meetings <laughs> at the Christ the King Church, two blocks away that I could walk to. Mm-hmm. Both fellowships were represented. Um I, I it's important that I share for myself. I attend both fellowships. Um I have read in one of their books that it says that you, you know, if you're willing to go to any lengths, and the answer is, is yes, I have to be willing to go to any lengths. It means I have to do whatever I have to do to stay clean and sober. I mean, that's the way I handled drinking and drugging. Mm -hmm. I I did a lot of stuff I'm not comfortable uh, sharing with folks, you know, to drink and drug the way I like to do it. Yep. Um, I'm very comfortable in telling you I had to do a lot of stuff I wasn't happy about to stay clean and sober. Uh, I became known as the guy, you know, the one-legged guy that rides a bicycle to meetings. In 1994, when I was attending meetings in the earlier part of my sobriety, I was literally riding uh, a bicycle, you know, throughout the, uh, let's see, uh, Woodlawn, Catonsville. Mm -hmm. I'd ride over to Arbutus, Ellicott City Mm -hmm. to attend meetings. Um, because it, that's what I needed to do. And anybody who's not from Maryland, like that's that's a fucking hike. Like that's not like right down the road. It, like, it, it, it's it's not a nice easy one mile of flat. No, it know? is up um, and down and around the fucking I, corner. I mean, Woodlawn to Ellicott City. It's a that's a bop. And that's there's a, bop a there's and a, and a big hill. You yeah, gotta yeah. you gotta I, deal with that. I, 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 I for a one legged guy on a fucking bicycle, that's any means necessary to stay clean it's it's what it turned into yeah you know it's what it had to be uh when i when i when i came back at that point you know in uh end of 93 early 94 and i was starting to run to people and i was really done with who i had become and it, it was becoming evident that uh Again, I could put together a couple of days, a couple of weeks, even a couple of months, and then I'd have a couple of drinks or smoke a little weed and then have a few more. Dr- oh, man, you know where all this goes, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, the, the, the mental gyrations of, of disappointment and failure uh, that I would feel far outweighed the physical illnesses at those points because I, mm. I just I had so little of everything I couldn't even put together really good drunks you know it's Ooh. not like I could buy yeah. a handle anymore yeah. you know if I could bum two or three beers I was having a good t- a good night mm. and 
you know, I don't get drunk on two or three beers. That's, no. that's getting mm-hmm. thirsty material. Um, so I was encountering some people early on in recovery, you know, near my age, which was helpful, uh, because I, I was concerned, um, I didn't want to be in a room with a bunch of 40-year-old gray-haired guys in trench coats talking about how great it was not being drunk today. Yeah. Ironically, I'm now one of those gray-haired old guys in the room who tells you he's happy not to be drunk today. I don't think I've seen you in a trench coat. <clears throat> I don't wear trench coats, but yeah, that's it, it's, weird. It's, it was just one of those things, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I went back and forth between both fellowships. Uh, I've... I've I'm very fortunate. I have people in both programs that I love intensely. And it doesn't matter if they do or don't love me. They seem genuinely okay to see me. Mm. And from where I was when I came in, just you being okay seeing me and not being pissed off, angry, or violent is is a good thing. Um, when they tell me that they, they care for me, I believe them because I've watched them be honest in recovery. And uh, that's a that's an amazing, uh, gratifying place to be today. But uh, I, I met some guys that were like, "Listen, dude, you know, you're, you're struggling. Why don't you why don't you come hang out with us? We're gonna we're gonna go to so and so's house. Mm-hmm. We're gonna play drums. We're gonna chant. We're gonna smoke Marlboros and drink coffee. And you know, if I wake up there the next morning, it was always it was cool. Yeah. And uh, I, I watch these guys. You know, this is in my first. I'm talking handfuls of days without alcohol and drugs. And these guys are literally talking about, you know, well, you got fired from this job and blah, 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 blah. And this guy didn't pay him for that tile work. And he's got, you know, this electrician thing didn't work out. And I got to go over here or this car has got a, this problem, but I talked to so-and-so and he's, you know, going to go ahead and do this work and mm. things that would totally derail my day for the whole month were happening to these guys. And they were just like, right on through it no problem i said something to this guy here i talked to this one here and this and and things just kept falling together and i'm like ah, how in the, you know i struggle with everything mm-hmm. I, you know I, I struggle i struggle with you know if someone says hi to me what do they mean by that you know <sighs> You know, this person wanted to give me a hug. What did she want? You know, who would, what did he, was he trying to pick my pocket? I'm flipping out over just everything. And these guys are just sliding through the, yeah. you know, horrible stuff with ease. And you're like, huh, if you don't drink and drug today, pretty good chance it'll get better. Mm-hmm. And I'm just devastated by this. Now, these guys got four, five, five, seven years, you know, between the two of them. Mm-hmm. I don't understand this. What do you mean if you don't drink or drug for today? Hop, it's real simple. We do a couple of things, and this is what we do all the time. We don't drink, trust God, clean house, and help others. Mm. And, and you've heard me oh, say yeah. this before. Those you know, eight famous words. JR catches me and you know, he says, it's simple, Hop, we don't use. We trust God, we clean house, we help others. He said, that's what this program's been teaching us for years, you know, and it works. And mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I struggled immensely with this whole trust God issue. Mm. God and I, as I understood it at that time, were not on speaking terms. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I heard, oh, you know, that's just God's will for them. You know, well, a lot of really screwed up shit's happened in my universe. And if this is God's will for me, God clearly has decided I have a bullseye birthmark that I don't see. <sighs> and I'm, uh, I'm tired of it. And I would really like to get off of this ride. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I remember having a really intense conversation with jr at one time and i said dude this god thing is just pissing me off me and god i don't like god god doesn't care for me Mm. and you know he says that's he says hop he says a lot of it is is you're really confused you're coming into this with all of these misunderstandings and misconceptions of god from all this misinformation in your life he goes what you really need to know about god is it can be whatever you want more importantly you need to know you're not it. Mm-hmm. Wow. That, that messed with me. You yeah. know? He says, you got you to gotta stop pretending like you're God. You're not in charge. Mm-hmm. He says, if you cannot put a, if you can't put your hands on it or you can't describe or define God, he says, that's fine. He goes, you're actually better off if you didn't have any of these wrong ideas. Mm-hmm. He said, you, what you need to come up with is you need to, you need to realize that 
that you that that God can be a very inspirational and loving force in your life, and you kind of have to follow along with it. But it means you're going to become you're going to get blended into the society and be a productive member of society, um, and stop trying to be in control of everything. Mm-hmm. And I I really struggle. And he goes, he says, I tell you what, he says, I need you to pray. I need you to pray every day. And for your own safety and sanity, you need to pray out loud. Mm -hmm. Why do I got to pray out loud? He goes, because if you pray to yourself, you're praying to yourself. Hmm. And I need you to understand that you Hmm. are not God. He said, if you vocalize your prayers, you project those out into the universe, whatever this higher power is going to become for you will be able to hear it. And you're inviting it to seek you out. He says, but you've got to stop doing it all in your head because that's where you're cre- you know, that's that's where you've been and you're lost. Yeah. I, I did not really understand how important that was when I did that. Yeah. All I did was, okay, so this is that fake it till you make it crap. Yeah. That's because I'd heard that in meetings a thousand times. So mm-hmm. that's what I'm gonna do. Um but I would and JR was really gr- was a very kind and loving man. He said, dude, you know what? Because you have no definition of a God that you can be comfortable with, he goes, when you pray, how about you pray to my God? Because if he keeps me clean and sober, he can work for you too. Mm-hmm. I get to borrow JR's God. And that's how my prayers would start out back at that mm-hmm. point. JR's God, if you're not too busy with <laughs> JR, I'd really appreciate it today if I could just go this 24 hours without thinking nonstop about how to get enough money to get a handle, to get some weed, to get some mm-hmm. acid, to get some play, you know. I'm looking, my brain had been consumed with the process of partying to this point. Oh, yeah. So um, that's where it all began. And and I got to be, again, I, I have no idea where are we on the clock. This this idea of, uh, of God as my higher power, I, I, have, I have changed my stance on that word several times in recovery. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't like it at all when I first got clean and sober. Um, I did become comfortable with it, and then I would start telling folks about it in uh, in probably maybe year three or four or five. Uh, I'm back to the point now where I'm hesitant to use the word God. Uh, I favor higher power mm-hmm. because I don't know who's going to hear me. I don't know who I'm going to talk to, mm-hmm. and I live in a place and in a time where if I'm meeting people at a meeting and the word God has a precognition to them that's negative or their otherwise assumed supreme being goes by a different name, I don't want to be what keeps them out of recovery. Mm -hmm. It is easier for me to stick with the term higher power and leave the associate, yeah, the yeah. interpretation and the word association game. Let them play that. Mm. I, I wouldn't. I'm far more concerned about being an open door to recovery and in, an invitation in than a roadblock keeping you out. Um, okay. If I oh, yeah. do, if I do nothing else on this podcast, if no one ever says you were helpful. I'll be okay as long as no one ever says, you know, I heard you and you're the reason why I didn't do this, mm. you know, and that, that's, that's become really important to me in my long-term recovery. So uh, when I finally made this shift to this higher power that I started praying to and things started coming into it, and I, and I know we've all heard this, you know, there's, there's fear, face everything and recover or F everything and run kind mm-hmm. of mentality. Uh, I learned slowly over time that when I, when I would invite my higher power of my understanding in, and I love the wording, you know, as we understood him, although mm-hmm. I would scratch him because sometimes my higher power yes, is clearly, yeah. uh, her. dude, oh, yeah. she's, she's just, just got this, she's got her mindset on reminding me who's in charge mm-hmm. and, and she doesn't make it easy at all. And I just have to be okay with it. Yep. But it, it's one of those deals where if I just do what I need to do and go forward, it usually works out. And I have learned by sheer volume of repetition that it's almost never as bad as I 
perceive it to be in my head. Mm -hmm. my, my mental gyrations are absolutely debilitating. Yep. Real life is nowhere near as hard as being up inside of this freaking this this space in my between my ears. Mm -hmm. This is this is not a safe zone for Scott. Scott requires adult supervision <laughs> at a minimum. And when I'm when I'm working my program and I'm on I'm on program, I have introduced and invited a supreme uh, a supernatural force to help me get through this. Because mm -hmm. I, I said earlier, you know, drinking and drugging is what I do naturally. The only thing that I know that can combat my natural behavior is a supernatural force. Uh -huh. And that's what my higher power is. It's a supernatural force that says, I know. Hold my hand. Come on. We're going to be okay. I know it's really scary. I know it is. But that's because you keep thinking about you got to do this by yourself, but you don't. Uh -huh. I got you covered. And not only do I got you covered, I got all kinds of people in my army that I, can, I keep bringing them to you. Yeah. One after another. And, you know, they're beautiful people if you stop judging them by their outsides and judge them by their actions. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I, I, I went through a bunch of years in my recovery in the beginning where I was extremely uh, judgmental of young people in recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how bad can your shit be? You're 18 years old. You still live in your folks' basement. If you, you know, you don't got to worry about paying the gas and electric bill or a car payment mm -hmm. or none of that shit. You don't even need to have a job. Your parents will take, how bad can your shit be? Yeah. You know, I'm 27 years old, man. If I screw this shit up, man, I, you know, I'm going to get kicked out again. And I had to get past all of that. You know what I mean? How bad could it be? How, look how pretty you are. All you got to do is smile and everything's going to happen positively. And I had, you know, <laughs> My higher power takes and smacks me with a two by four to me and says, dude, did I put you here to think that shit? No, you're supposed to be trying to stay clean and sober and by the way, help somebody. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, this judgmental crap doesn't help nobody. It certainly doesn't help you. Yeah. You're thinking you're more than again. Uh, so, so over time, I, I, I have, you know, if again, if I can be in a position where I can be helpful to these younger people coming in, mm -hmm. that's, that's really great. Uh, I need to... I need to be very realistic about where where I am and what I can do. Mm -hmm. The uh, I I made a vigilant process of working through the steps when I finally got to it. Uh, Jr. was giving me grief at one point about you know it's coming up on I don't know seven eight months or whatever, and you got that waltz kind of feel going on. We've talked about you you know the unmanageability. You we talked about the insanity, and I, and I could go on about the insanity of this. That's that's a whole oh, yeah, that's, podcast yeah, right yeah, there, yeah, yeah. and this decision to turn your will and your life over. Mm -hmm. um, he says, but you, you when you when you when you say those things, you take no action and you don't back it up. And that's mm -hmm. what the whole purpose of this fourth step is. He says, I need you to go write this fourth step out so that we can move through the rest of these steps. Because again, if I'd been around now at this point, uh, it's 95, but before my anniversary and the idea that from first being introduced to the program in 90 and I've, I've attended plenty of meetings and I've, I've bothered to recite the steps enough times, and it says to practice these principles in all our affairs. And he goes, the only way that anybody can practice these principles is, is you have to go through them. Mm -hmm. As good or as bad as it is, you have to go through them. And then it's repetition is practice. He goes, it's like, dude, he goes, you're, when you're playing your guitar and you play yeah, the same yep. song yep. 15 times in a row, it's because you're trying to get better at it. He goes, we don't just do these 12 steps once and then it's done. He goes, we do this over and over and over again. We wear this stuff out, man. He goes, this is this is the program for living life every single day. Mm -hmm. And he goes, the, the, the more adept you become at identifying where you are in this process, the quicker you can readjust and move forward and be okay. Mm -hmm. I uh, I succumbed to his his strong suggestions on a Friday night. I went upstairs and... I burned through a box of cigarettes. I wrote down probably what is one of the crappiest fourth steps ever um, that I thought for sure when the home office in New York got it, I would get an F. Um, but uh, JR was pretty pretty uh, compassionate. And Saturday morning, we sat down. We, we put a pot of coffee together, had a couple of Marlboros. We said a prayer before the fifth step. And we sat down and we hashed out this fifth step on Saturday morning. 
And I don't remember. At some point, we finally, like, it's clearly getting near time for more coffee and get something to eat and take the hour break that's talked about uh, in the in the big book, you know, for an earnest and honest reflection of how real and true that I was to this point in time. And uh, I, I we did all of that. And then it, I started on with the next prayer and got on to the sixth step, you know. I was ready to have all of this crap and cruddy pieces that I knew was a problem to be gone. Mm-hmm. And we spent that weekend working through the steps. Mm-hmm. Uh, we stopped at the 10th step on Saturday night and talked about the discussion about, you know, if I were going to live my days the way that I had lived this this one day, that this was going to be a whole lot easier for me. Um, and I, again, I got some ADD issues, so I jump around and skip and bounce, and that's just the way it is for my brain. But it, that was kind of like an, uh, a really... That was a really imperative moment for me to realize that this was actually a pretty good day. Yeah. Um, I think that was probably the first time, you know, if, if when, when I look at my sobriety to this point, that's the pivoting point. You mm-hmm. know, we, we joked about I don't I didn't know what my actual clean and sober date was for yeah. the first few years because I had all of these half ass incidences throughout all of 93 and into early 94. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of those times was as lame as I went into a bar, I sat down, and I had a Zima. Oh, you turd. Oh, my God. You total turd. I mean, really, from the kind of guy that I am, to sit down and have a Zima. And even after (laughs) after one Zima to go, oh, my God, I got to get out of here. You know what I mean? Because... And this is the guy now that's grinding through this, and I'm sitting here thinking, "The 10th step." You know what I mean? I don't, I don't have to apologize to anybody for today. Now, my ninth step list is still pretty big yeah. this particular Saturday, but my 10th step for today, I don't owe any amends for today. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sunday started out with coffee, Marlboro cigarettes, prayer. Uh, we discussed the 11th step, you know, through prayer and meditation, sought to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. And I go, higher power, but uh, practice, you know, 12th step. Jerry said, oh, that's right. By the way, I've, uh, I'm secretary in the noon meeting today, and you're my speaker. What? That's a dope fiend-ass way to he do said, that. He said, yeah, dude, you're, you're, my, you're my speaker today. Yeah. He said, I've been with you since Friday night. And if you don't realize that this has been a spiritual experience to this date, what does this 12 step tell you to do? Mm-hmm. It says to practice these principles all your affairs and carry this message to the alcoholic addict who still suffers. Mm-hmm. You're my speaker. You need to tell somebody. This is how this is this is part of that don't pick up, <laughs> trust God, clean house, help others. Mm-hmm. Help others. Hoppy, you need to help others. You need to tell them because there's somebody who wasn't clean and sober yesterday doesn't have any idea how you did that. Mm -hmm. And you can tell them. That was, uh, like I said, that was probably back in 95. I had a really crappy job. I've been very lucky in my sobriety. Uh, I've, I've since then found gainful employment and I don't have to rent you know, crappy apartments anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I haven't taken a woman hostage. I, I was very fortunate to find a woman that would, she voluntarily would like to share my days with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm blessed. She makes every single day better because she's willing to share her days with me. Mm-hmm. Um, she also expanded my family circle by when we found out we were pregnant you know, instead of having a normal reaction and running in fear to get away from me, she yeah. told me the truth. And my kid turned 20 this year. Um, and that's, you know, it just blows my mind. In recovery, I have found it within myself to be honest with people and to share what it's been like to get to here. And along the way, um, people have reached out to me to say that they've got issues with food and drugs, alcohol, gaming, Mm. those kinds of things. And in an indirect or more direct way, I've been able to help them get to the different fellowships 
that work for them. Mm -hmm. And I can go to any one of those meetings and be really comfortable, mm -hmm. which is scary. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's really scary because, you know, every time I, it's like, if it's got 12 steps and ends in an A, I probably am good. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm only sharing that. I don't, I'm, I'm not looking for credit or accolades. It's an absolute blessing that, that it tells me that other people see something that they think is worthwhile. And I've been just uh, immensely thankful. I've gone to their anniversaries. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them have five, six, seven, eight years now, you know, whether it's alcohol free or drug free or, you know, this food issue is another one that really boggles my mind or they've been game free for three years again, mm -hmm. you know, and you're just like, I didn't have anything to do with that other than hopefully when they went searching, I was a vessel or a channel that said, here's how we get to that. Yeah. You know, and then I get to watch, I get to watch their miracle happen. And that's been uh, amazing. I have met quite a few guys through the guys that I've had the blessings to work with. You know, mm -hmm. if you think your fourth and fifth step is freaking hard, wait till you do a fourth and fifth step with a sponsee. And now it's, you know, you're supposed to be the person who's got a handle on this. And you're like, man, I'm learning way more about myself through my sponsee's fourth and fifth steps than I did when I did it myself, you know, when I did yeah. mine with my sponsor at the time. Uh, and then you get, I'm old enough that I got grand sponsees and uh, the, these men will reach out to you. I'm and, one of them. Like, 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 like you've, like you've got something. And I'm like, man, you know, all I've got is today. Um, I'm really honored that you would turn to me and ask me, but we're, we're, we're going to be talking about the same stuff still. We're, we're mm -hmm. not going to pick up. We're going to trust our higher power. We're going to clean house and we're going to try to help others. And if we just keep doing that really simple process, we might actually get good at it. Yep. On a, on a bad day, it's an, it's a challenge and it's not easy and stuff doesn't go well. On a good day, I feel a little more comfortable about it. On a great day, it's effortless. And my higher power just amazes me with what I am allowed to see and be a part of. Mm -hmm. And I have to keep reminding myself that if I just don't get in my own damn way, pretty good chance I'm going to get through this day and have one like it again tomorrow. Yep. And that's... Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what I've been doing lately. And I, I don't have any idea how long I've talked. My God. Um, an hour and 10 minutes. Holy Jesus. I think that's a good stopping point. <laughs> that's a good stopping you, point. Okay. Just, if you're done. Yeah. Yeah. That's. <laughs> this motherfucker said he had seven minutes in him before he started this. Before we started recording, he's like, I got seven it's, good fucking minutes in me. It's pretty consistent though, right? Like everyone doesn't. Every, yeah, yeah. Everybody's like, oh, I'm not going to be able to talk at all. And then it's just boop, 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 boop. <laughs> No. Um, all right. Fantastic job. We're gonna have, we got some questions for you. Always little, follow little up questions. Little Q and A. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I think okay. I'm gonna go first. All right. So you've been out. You've been in recovery for 24 plus years now. How have you kept recovery exciting? And like, well, two part. Has it like gotten monotonous or boring at any points? And then how do you? rekindle that flame for recovery mm, it, it, that's actually a, a really good question and I, because i've been at this for a while mm -hmm. you know it's hard for me to share all of the things I, I i really would like to be pertinent oh yeah um i i got a little uh i got a little out of joint with recovery and meetings probably around year three but mm -hmm. that was about the time i met my now wife and um when we started running together, hanging together, you know, it uh, one of God's gifts, my higher power's gifts became a little bit more enjoyable than going to meetings. And within a year, we're living together and 18 months we're expecting. And within two years, I'm a dad mm. and a new job. And I, again, now I don't pay a rent. I'm working yeah, on a mortgage. Yeah. You know, and uh, for a guy who doesn't have his driver's license at this point, you know, or paying on a car and, and I'm very involved with that. And the next thing you know, um, my ninth 
anniversary has gone by and I haven't been to a meeting since my third. Ooh. I, uh, I, and I'm only saying that because I don't suggest it. I'm just admitting to that's what happened. I got very caught up in, you know, new girlfriend, new, new role as a dad, role as a homeowner, uh, a new job. I mean, I had, I changed jobs, I think three times in that period where, you know, uh, and every time it was an escalation of responsibilities and earnings, you know, because I'm a dad now, I really need, oh, yeah. to, I need to be doing these things. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I worked, you know, at one point, I, you know, 55 hour weeks became fairly regular and they're just, you know, it's more important to spend time with my wife or my kids than go to meetings and, you know, I'm not drinking or drugging, but mm -hmm. so when I got back, finding a home group to fit, reconnecting with a sponsor that worked um, and being available to work with people coming in uh, really helps. And again, as I've gotten older and my responsibilities, you know, my role as parenting has decreased and I find myself able to do other things, but it's, it's a changing process. Um, oh yeah. I, at 24 years, my home group is actually a big book study group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm literally back at the very beginning of where I was, where it's far more important me, to me at this time to be reading out of the original source literature, yeah. the, the big book, the 12 and 12. Um, I'm helping other people who are coming in to study this literature. You know, I'm working with guys from a home group that I've been in now. We've 20, I think I'm actually the youngster, 24 years. Uh, Ed's 25 years. Gene's 26 six or seven years and we're studying from the book to keep it, you know, I, I don't want to say fresh, but to, to stay relevant yeah. and pertinent. I don't want to get caught up on any of this today crap that doesn't matter. Staying clean and sober is what's important to be the opportunity for somebody to come in. This is where, this is where you start. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. All right. I'm turning it over, turn it over there. See what he's got. Let's see. So, Okay, so uh, with like the cancer, mm -hmm. right? And um, that was at a young age. And obviously you mentioned it a little bit of how, how the acceleration mm -hmm. of, you know, when you're 14, you know, you started and it was just like, well, fuck it. <laughs> and like, you were like, we're just going to see how far we can take this. Do you think that, you know, and, and obviously you can't go back in time, right? This is the hand you were dealt. Right. But how much of a part do you think the medical condition led to your acceleration to where your addiction took you? Oh, that's, I, you know, it's, it's really strange. Uh, I've, I've known a couple of men talk about the point where there's a story where a cucumber becomes a pickle. <laughs> and uh, I don't, you know, if you guys haven't heard that one or not, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know that I was ever a cucumber. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think I might have been born the pickle. Mm -hmm. um, I I heard I heard your like I said I was listening to yours earlier and and it's really funny we we've got similarities in our stories as different as we are in age and location oh, yeah. you know I, I remember this time of the year Halloween I remember running from house to house to get as much candy and knowing that if I didn't put it into my pants pockets or shove it into my socks that my mom was going to get that from the basket and that was going to mean that there was candy that I would be rationed out instead of eating the way that I wanted to, which is yeah. like, you know, Fucking the seventh a. and eighth Snickers in a row yep. is way better than the first four, five, six. Hell yeah. And and that's, you know, I don't know that at seven years old, you're supposed to think about eating, you know, eight as Snickers in a row. As much candy as possible. It's, Hell it's, yeah. I love candy. So I, oh. I don't, I don't know that the medical condition, it's, it's contributory. How's that? Okay. It, it, it almost made it easier because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to retire. Hell, I'm not even going to make 30. I didn't think, I didn't think 18 was realistic for me. I thought I'd be yeah. dead in years. You know what I'm saying? I thought yeah. I was going to be gone in three years. And, uh -huh. you know, turning 18, turning 21, and then turning 25, you're like, oh. See, and I've been really good with my language because I know at some point my wife 
where is she at? My son is going to end up getting a hold of this. <laughs> and I, I really am trying so hard to not curse like I do naturally. You've, yeah. you've I been think, pretty well. Actually. I, I, yeah, I really well. well it's it's not easy, you know. No. But I'm concerned about who may hear this later. Um, it just it was one of those deals where you did you 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 said fuck it, mm-hmm. and you put the pedal to the metal, and I didn't think that I would ever have to go. Wow, ten years is going by already. You know, mm. I was gray by forty. I'm not sure whether it was the medical condition or the way that I lived, but. <laughs> you know, both contributory. Yeah. All right, so this is a, you know, I mean, I think cocktails are the best. Personally, from my using days, I I really don't think about one drug. I think about a cocktail of drugs. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, yep. Oh yeah. So, out of curiosity, what was your favorite cocktail? More. More. Yep. Now. <laughs> More and now. Yeah. Um, I, I I like cold. Um, I like a little bit of fizzy because you can burp, and I like to burp. You know what I mean. Yeah. And if if you're gonna if you're gonna drink something cold, whether it's a, a beer or a rum and coke or one of those fruity Hawaiian drinks, uh-huh. you might as well freaking have a really nicely rolled joint, or yeah. or you know do some bong hits. Just because I mean bong hits are bong hits, man. I mean if you yeah. think smoking a joint's good, bong hits are better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just. True. They just are, you know. My my stepfather trashed at least four different of my US twos while I was living at his house, and when I was when I was a little older and poor, we we did gravities out of a five gallon bucket with that three liter. Oh, yeah, yeah the, the, the Gatorade bottle. No, the three liter oh, the three soda, liter soda bottle. Yeah, because oh, yeah. the two liter bottle's not big it's enough. It's not we, big enough. Right, we can no. do gravities with no, a three we, liter we bottle. Get more smoke out of this motherfucker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> three liter. I, Oh yeah, they have three liters. They're like fucking Dollar General. Oh yeah, like, they're crappy soda, yeah, but you, you soda poured that shit out. Yeah. You yeah. Yeah. Fuck the soda. Yeah, you were literally getting it for the bottle. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's an extra liter of smoke going in. I'm Hell like the, yeah. yeah, the sixty-nine cent gravity of kings. Yeah, <laughs> my my only fucking addition to like your cocktail is I I I fucking love the uppers because the uppers allowed you to stay awake longer to enjoy all the other shit. I, well, you know, it's it's one of those things where I'm not opposed to them, but. It's one of those deals that, you know, I probably, instead of taking an amphetamine or cocaine, mm-hmm. now, if we're talking about LSD, we're going to trip. Oh, yeah. Because now, you know, I'm going to wake I up with that. still threw all the other shit on top of it. Well, I'm, I can, I'm not going to do just that, yeah. but I would add that on top because, oh, yeah. again, I know that means I'm going to wake up with that pain in my face from laughing mm-hmm. oh, for yeah. hours. Oh, yeah. And I always thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> Another crazy thing we think. So, are you not stealing my question? I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'll steal it. Fuck it. Okay. So, how in recovery has your has your addiction manifested itself? Oh, dude. You know, and again, I've heard this question on the other people down here, and um, <clears throat> without boy, we'll go forever. <laughs> What's the I, big I would, one? I would say. I would say similar to what you've heard before. Um, as a as remind you now that at the time now thirty years old when I first got mm-hmm. here, I I think the uh, the exploration of sexuality and you know like you can't get enough oh, yeah. early on in recovery, um, and there's this whole sex and recovery is so different from sex and active addiction and drinking. Oh um, yeah, you know physically it's different uh, emotionally it's different uh, psychologically it's different because mm-hmm. you're you know th- this may be the first time ever that you're actually that, present yeah, in that you're, situation that you're involved with this person and there's actually like you know I care about this person mm-hmm. you know this is this is this isn't just for me to get my yayas this is for me <laughs> I want to be invited back. I want I want her to feel good, you know. I want her to think, to, yeah. So that's probably another one. I, I, the retail sales I've heard about. Uh, oh, yeah. Me personally, as I've gotten a little older, I I find myself interested in reliving reliving moments of my childhood. I I, 
Um, Alice Cooper concerts. I like to go to a lot of concerts. David will tell you. I, I do I do go to a fair amount of rock shows. Um, I like big and loud and fast and crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I do model rockets because they remind me of when I was younger and I like seeing Ooh. shit burn and fly. Um, yeah, cool. I've, I? I've recently gotten back into uh, model railroading because I just love trains. Um, I, as a, as a grown up, I enjoy the relaxation of smoking cigars. I probably mm -hmm. probably smoke more cigars than my cardiologist wants to know about, but I'm not going to tell him about this podcast, and I will lie to him when I see him next. That's spiritual. <laughs> yes, there's you know, it's progress, not perfection. <laughs> yeah. I I am, just need to be a little better today than yesterday, dude. Okay, that's. <laughs> So, uh, last question. Sure. Um, and to preface this, obviously, each step is important in its own way. Uh -huh. um, but let's say that you have to choose one that is the most influential in your life. Which one do you say is that step? Wow, that is... Um, Can't say all of them. Well, you, but you, but you, but you know who my sponsor was for the longest time, and Mike would kill me if I didn't say all twelve all the time. So oh, I'll say that. Um, oh, we'll get Mike on here we'll sooner. Get, we'll or get later. Mike on here. Um, I, you know, I really, I, I don't. I, I'm not really comfortable telling you there's one that makes it more. Nope, you gotta choose. Not, no, not no that cop makes outs. it more, just one that you've utilized. Or a personal more, favorite. Or a personal favorite. <sighs> okay, then I'm gonna share this with you guys. Uh, in the uh, in the big book, there's the set of 10th step questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you get yourselves in the habit of taking a look at those questions and asking those questions of yourself, every night you will become aware of the things that i don't want to get caught up in today that are going to have to make me answer those questions later this evening that mean i've got more work to do mm -hmm. i mean i'm inherently mm. lazy as a human being so my awareness of those know, shit you only put one shoe on my awareness of those questions and not wanting to have to answer them in a manner that requires follow-up and work later puts me in a state of mind that during the day when something happens that's out of skew with the way that I think it should be, I, again, when I'm lucky, when my day is going really, really well, there's a pause. There's this fraction of a second that happens between the event and my reaction, and then that fraction of a second, I might not have to act out and be a dumbass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I might just be able to be kind and compassionate and loving towards other people, and maybe even towards people that might not deserve it if I thought too long about it. Mm. So there is the way a lazy guy takes this step and and uses it to his full <laughs> fullest advantage i just i just don't want to have a whole lot of work at the end of the night i would rather be able to think through those steps and say awesome dude i appreciate this one see you tomorrow yeah yeah so 10 it is you're I'm recognizing gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with 10 all right 10's a 10's a great answer tens, yeah, tens it's 10's a, tens a really answer. good answer all right. Anything else? No, we're, we're good. We're good. All man. right. Awesome. Well, we would like to thank our very esteemed guest, yes. Hoppy, aka Scott, for uh, joining us today. Lynn oh. is even trying to clap get up track. Here. Yeah, dog's trying to get it on the clap yeah. track. Yeah. All come, right. Come see us at a meeting, please. It's yeah. your it's your butt you're saving. Oh, absolutely. And uh, here at Podcast Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that a powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope, and Podcast Recovery is here to provide it. All right. Well, uh, yeah, follow us on Facebook. Check out our, our page, our website. Uh, we're available on your podcast apps, on Twitter. Share, like us, follow, subscribe. Do all that shit. Do all, yeah. the, do all the social media stuff with us. And uh, any, any, any final words? 
don't let me be what keeps you out. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you next week. Stay safe. Stay clean.